Mr. Speaker, it is our constitutional obligation to ensure that our government is running efficiently. From our children who need quality education to our veterans who need the benefits promised to them when they put their lives on the line for their country, and to our senior citizens who need access to health care and affordable prescription drugs. And I'm proud to say that we, here in the House of Representatives, have fulfilled our fiscal responsibility to the American people by passing all 12 of our appropriations bills on time. We've also used our time this year to pass all of the 9-11 Commission recommendations to increase the minimum wage, to promote a 21st century jobs and global economic initiative, add much needed funds to the Gulf Coast following Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and to undertake the largest expansion of college age since the GI Bill in 1944. We also passed the widely acclaimed landmark lobby and ethics reform standards, enacted pay go, resulting in no new deficit spending, and passed an unprecedented energy bill that will help our nation to be more energy efficient while addressing global warming. We will not soon forget that of the 12 appropriations bills that we were supposed to have passed in 2006, when Republicans controlled the chamber, only two were completed. The others were abandoned, requiring the incoming Democrat majority to meet the responsibilities abdicated by an outgoing party that now claims a mantle of fiscal responsibility. Simply put, we were forced to clean up their mess. And according to the Office of Management and Budget, President Bush and the Republican Congress increased federal spending by nearly 50 percent, turned record surpluses into record deficits, and increased our national debt by more than $3 trillion. And let's not forget that President Bush and Republican-controlled Congress doubled our foreign debt to more than $2 trillion. More in seven years, Mr. Speaker, more in just seven years than in the previous 224 years of our nation combined. Listen to that, America. They did more in seven years to uh, run up the debt than the previous 224 years of our nation combined. Now, all this among bus budget failures that vastly increased our national debt while leaving the agencies, states, and localities in limbo for months concerning their future funding. Let me add to that our children's health program. It is simply astounding to me that the President would request an 11 percent increase for the Pentagon, a 12 percent increase for foreign aid, and $195 billion of emergency funding for this terrible war, while in the same breath claiming that any increase in domestic programs needed for the citizens is fiscally irresponsible. We all remember the promises of the Bush administration claiming that at the most the Iraq war would cost $50 billion. A recent report issued on November 13th states that the total economic cost of the Iraq war through 2008 exceeds $1.3 trillion with a projected cost of $3.5 trillion, a long way from $50 billion. I believe the New York Times editorial board said it succinctly in their editorial published last week when they wrote, and I quote, we know what's behind President Bush's sudden enthusiasm for fiscal discipline after years of running up deficits and debt, political posturing just in time for the 2008 election, close quote. But one should not forget the damage by his administration inflicted by shortchanging domestic programs in favor of tax cuts for the wealthy and his never-ending Iraq war. I would like to have this editorial submitted to the congressional record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this week's actions by the President is just one thread in the appalling tapestry that this administration has in its misplaced policies. Democrats believe that running this House right is a matter of pride. We believe it's a matter of having a fundamental respect for both the institution in which we serve and for the citizens who have given us the privilege to serve here. In the spirit of working together, Democrats in Congress collectively extended our hand to those on the other side of the aisle, including the President, to reconcile our differences and pass this important spending bill. 
In return, we receive nothing but the same obstructionism that has plagued our body and our counterpart on the other side of the Capitol. And today, those same members who once enjoyed the splendors of having a majority in the House, the Senate, and a Republican president now chastise the Democrat Congress for trying to solve their own fiscal blunders. But their cries ring hollow, Mr. Speaker. Democrats have crafted this ominous appropriations bill that invests in the American people's priorities, that protects our troops, that invests in the home front, and restores funding to the President's devastating cuts to medical research, to college assistance, to job training and education and health care. And when my fellow members of Congress and I cast our votes on this floor this evening, we seek to reconcile our ideals with what is possible to achieve. We seek to do both what is right in principle and necessary at any particular point in time and pray that the two are one and the same. In this bill, we fund programs for medical research and we provide 280,000 more underinsured Americans with access to health care. We added extra funds for Title I, especially education, so special education, teacher quality grants, after school programs, and Head Start, while also adding more for Pell Grants and other student aid programs. We added extra funds above the President's request to help local communities hire and train more local law enforcement, while also adding more in Homeland Security grants to better secure our nation. We also have met the guaranteed level set in the authorization bill while adding funds for our bridges, which sorely needs. We invest in solar and wind energy, biofuels, and energy efficiency, while also promoting scientific investments and conservation efforts. And I would like to stress that this bill provides $3.7 billion in additional funding for our veterans' health. Mr. Speaker, we all agree that it's unfortunate we are forced to pass an omnibus to get our work done at the end of the year. Especially disheartening because we Democrats in the House of Representatives have been absolute in our pledge to fund important programs to help the American people. And this omnibus comes only as a remedy to the obstructionism in the other body. The President should accept this reasonable compromise and sign it into law. It is a crucial bill that will keep us on our course of fulfilling our promises to the American people. And I believe it is a clear demonstration of the Democrats' devotion to being fiscally responsible with the money given to us by our fellow citizens. As I shared a quote from the editorial of the New York Times earlier, I would like to quote, close with another quote published on November 26. It states, quote, It is clear that Mr. Bush's threat to veto Congress's proposed spending bills has nothing to do with fiscal discipline. It's all about appealing to his base and distracting attention from his failings like a rock. Mr. Bush will no doubt persist in that mode as long as his Republican allies allow him to do so. End quote. I could not agree more. I thank you, and I reserve the balance of my time. General Lady Reserves. The gentleman from Florida is recognized.